It was the year 1995, and I was a 20-year-old woman. I worked as a dining room manager at a popular breakfast restaurant. All of the employees would meet once a week at a local bar to hang out. I had to use my older sister's ID because I had just turned 20. I was excited this particular night because the manager that I had a huge crush on was coming. That night, I had decided not to drink too much, and that would probably be the main factor in my survival. The guy that I had a crush on chose not to drink either. When closing time came, we all decided to go over to another coworker's house because we were still having fun. As I was leaving to get in my car, the guy that I had a crush on asked me if I wanted to ride with him. He said that he would bring me back to get my car in the morning. I happily agreed and I jumped in the car. As we were pulling out, he decided to do a huge burnout to show off. We got about two miles down the road when we saw police lights behind us. He pulls over and the police officer makes him do the whole, are you drunk dance. He wasn't drunk, but the police officer searched him and found a single pill that was not in its prescribed bottle. They decided to arrest him and take his car. I had told them that I was only 20, but they didn't seem to care. They told me to walk to the gas station and call somebody to pick me up. This gas station was the only place open being that it was the middle of the night. I didn't want to wake my family up, so I decided to walk the two miles back to get my car. I was afraid though, because I was aware that there was nothing open in between that gas station and the bar parking lot that my car was in. I started walking, keeping my eyes open for anything creepy. It wasn't too long before the typical abductor's vehicle pulled up. It was a big, black, windowless van. I was walking northbound, which made the passenger side closest to me. A man who was about 30 asked me if I needed a ride. I, of course, said no and continued on. He continued to ask a few more times, but he realized that I was not budging. I had that gut feeling you get when you know that something is just wrong. He just continues driving at my walking pace. He's looking around nervously. I had no doubt that he was trying to figure out how to get me. I was thinking of what I would do if he tried. I decided that if his car stopped, I was going to run to the other side of the road back towards the gas station. At this point, I was about halfway back to my car. After keeping at my pace for a while, he drove off. For a minute, I thought he had given up, but he just went down a little bit and then turned around and drove past me. I watched him turn around again and head back toward me. He pulls up to me again and asks me to get in. I said, no, I don't need a ride. He just drove at my pace again. He would pull off every time another car drove by, but would come back after. Then, as we were getting close to where my car was, I was trying to decide how I could get to my car safely. The bar was in the corner of an L-shaped small shopping strip. There were about five stores on each side of the bar, with the bar being in the corner. My car was right in front of the bar, which was pretty far back from the street that I was walking on. He pulled off again, but this time, he pulled a little past the area that my car was in and parked turning his lights off. If I had to keep walking straight, it would have been hard for me to get by where he was parked. I decided to count to three and run toward my car with everything I had. I had my keys in hand, pushing the unlock button as I ran. I kept my eye on what he was doing as well. He pulled toward me, slowly, but I think he was wondering what in the world I was doing running into a closed, dark parking lot. As I reached my car and jumped in, he pulled right in front of it. As I was locking the door, we made eye contact. He looked shocked that I had a car. I backed out and took off. I watched behind me, making sure that he wasn't following me. After I got home, I debated on calling the cops, but I thought nothing would come of it, so, regrettably, I didn't. It was about a year later, while watching the news, that I saw him and his van again. He had kidnapped and murdered a young woman. 
They actually believe he killed more than just her, though. I was devastated. I'm not sure if I had called the police if anything would have changed, but at least it would have been on record. I learned that people looking for victims will often drive around to bars at closing time, hoping to find a drunk woman walking home alone. I really do believe that not drinking that night saved my life. Before I get into the story, there are a few things I need to explain about my country, South Africa. In South Africa, it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences, alarms, etc. The crime here is hectic. It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time we had six dogs, two German short-haired pointers and two dachshunds. With that being said, our dogs roam freely in and out of the garden, as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day for them to do their thing. Another thing about South Africa is that it's normal to have a live-in domestic worker, like a maid or a gardener. The average family usually employs them. It's not just for wealthy people. For the story, our domestic worker is Ellie and our gardener is Vince. So this happened in 2007, when I was nine years old. My older brother, who was 10, and I had just gotten our first cell phones that day. My dad surprised us after work. You may think it's a bit young, but it was used for emergencies or to communicate with our parents. Anyway, it's an important piece of information for later. We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night for security reasons. But I remember that it was a hot summer night, so, of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open, and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in my parents' room, setting up our new cell phones, all excited. Ellie's daughter, Anne, who's like a sister to us, she was 18, was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house, and my mom was in the bath. I specifically remember Anne having a comment about how the dogs wouldn't shut up and how annoying it was, and that's when I noticed it too. I mean, sure, they would bark, but it was usually the dachshunds that yapped. The bigger dogs just chilled out. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes and then they'd get over it. Something was different that night. Even the bigger dogs were barking nonstop. My dad appeared in his room and mentioned to us that he too noticed the dog's incessant barking, and he was going to check if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head, and I don't believe my dad thought anything was amiss either, because my brother asked to investigate with him and my dad agreed. I was obviously way too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad ventured out to our garden with my brother in tow, when my dad had noticed the dogs were all grouped, growling, and going nuts at a dark corner behind our swimming pool. The best way I can describe it is that the garden beyond the pool hits like a slight decline, so we have a few steps leading down the hill to the bottom end of our garden. We usually have a lamp that lights it up, but my dad noticed how that lamp seemed to be off, which confused him because he could have sworn it was just working. Either way, my dad said that he got this gut-wrenching feeling because of all of this, and just because of how out of character the dogs were acting. He called them, and usually they would come running, but tonight they all seemed to just look at him, then turn back around and continue going crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a flashlight sort of using it as an excuse for my brother to not come with him because of this feeling he had. When my brother went back inside to get the torch, my dad was slowly approaching the steps. He noticed how the dog seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out of view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched toward the steps, and as he put two and two together, 
it was too late. My dad, being an ex-vet and avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple and immediately knew it was a gun. Out of the darkness stepped four other men in balaclavas, all armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was, that he saw my dad come outside with my brother, but that my brother went back into the house. Why? My dad said something came over him, and before he knew what he was saying, he responded with, he's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all of these guys started to panic. They started speaking in an African language called Zulu. He assumed that my dad couldn't understand because it's not common for white people to speak it. But my dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learned it fluently because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said in Zulu, shit, the cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill this effer, grab what we can and go. The other seemed apprehensive and a smaller guy seemed really on edge. He continued saying how he can't go back to jail and they need to get out of there before the cops show up, which would be any minute. He was panicking. My dad then fed on this guy's fear. My dad then interrupted them, speaking English and pretending not to understand what they were saying, and said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drive in our area, and since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago, they'll probably be here any second. And that did it. My dad watched as their plan unraveled before them. The smaller, scared guys started freaking out all the other guys, saying they had to leave right away or they'd be caught. He seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence, until they started full-on bickering amongst themselves, their plan slowly turning to crap. The aggressive one pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it, as they all started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto the crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly back up the steps and turn and dart into the house. As luck would have it, my dad ran into the veranda door. My oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arms mid-run, sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly, I know, but I think he was just thinking about getting my brother inside. Anne and I were obviously also oblivious to everything, when my dad rushed through the bedroom door, slammed it shut, and told us to go upstairs to the attic. There's five guys outside with guns. They're here to hurt us. Get upstairs, now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding and me sprinting to the stairs with Anne right behind. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel not too far behind. We sat there in the darkness, in silence. I swear you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just waiting to hear something below us in the rooms. My mom cursed, saying she didn't have a phone. Neither did my dad. But ha, in my hand was my brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it in than right now, right? My mom dials the police, and I kid you not, they asked where we lived. We explained, and they said it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry. Click. The line goes dead. We're now not only absolutely shitting ourselves, but we're flabbergasted too. My mom starts cursing like a sailor again, and that's when my dad realizes. Damn, he didn't close the veranda door. And what about Ellie and Vince, who are in their rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in? He gets his firearm in the safe in the attic and tells us that whatever we hear, we are not to come downstairs, to stay hidden no matter what. I'm now sobbing, begging my dad not to leave us, but he says he has to go get Ellie and Vince before something bad happens to them. Now there are even more tears, because reality hits that there are two other people still in danger. Anne is understandably in hysterics because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears, and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dogs going crazy, indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, the armed security that drives around the area, and they said they'd be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They said to wait and stay hidden until they ring our bell at the gate. We all wait in silence, fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or something indicating those men are in our house, but there was just silence. 
The only sound was the dogs barking outside. After what seemed like hours, but was most likely a couple of minutes, we heard stomping coming up the stairs, and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and just praying that it was my dad with Ellie and Vince. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while and nobody dared to speak. The dogs seemed to have calmed down considerably, but were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang, and my dad told us to wait while he checked if it was the security company. And sure enough, it was. He opened up, and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees just buckling from the adrenaline my body had just endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there were actually seven pairs of footprints and that these guys bent the spikes on our wall and just climbed right over. We got an electric fence shortly after that. So there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen, which is actually creepy in its own right. South Africa's violent crime is quite bad, and it's sickeningly common for torture and other things to happen during home invasions. I was obviously so young at the time, I didn't know the horrors of the world, and I was just scared of my family getting hurt. Now that I'm older, just the thought of four women being in the house and my mom being in nothing but a bath towel gives me chills to this day. The cops said that the fact that there were so many guys, instead of like one to three, indicated that these guys possibly had very sinister intentions. Thank goodness nothing happened to my family, and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and could manipulate the situation to benefit us. Lastly, my family will forever be in debt to our good boys and girls that warned us that night our dogs. A terrifying and life-changing outcome would have 100% happened that night had it not been for our incredible dogs. From that day forward, my dad always gives them leftover rice or meat with their dinner. Rest in peace to all of you. I'm sure there was a special place in heaven reserved just for you angels. Close to 10 years ago, my best mate and I scored the deal of the century. Liv and her parents recently purchased and refurbished home for cheap as chips rent, so that the property wasn't considered unoccupied and their insurance would still cover it. They were planning on selling their house in the country and moving closer to town in a year. But when they spotted this place, it was perfect, so they snapped it up. They couldn't be bothered dealing with rando tenants for a year, so they offered it to us. Awesome. It was a lovely old mid-Victorian style house with a hallway running the majority of the length on the left side and three bedrooms and a bathroom coming off that hallway to the right. At the back of the house was an open plan living room and kitchen and a backyard. It was in an inner Melbourneian suburb so it was totally fenced in with six foot fences on three sides. The front had a cutesy white picket fence. On the right side of the property, an outdoor gravel pathway was wedged beside the bedroom walls and the fence line. It began with a gate in the front yard and ran the length of the property to the backyard. My mate obviously scored the master bedroom at the front with lovely vertically opening bay windows facing the front garden and street. I had the next bedroom, with a window facing the gravel path and fence. The third bedroom was our study. We lived here for close to 10 months in bliss. Great house, great company, and even though the area was considered a little dicey, the location was great. One hot summer's night, we said our good nights, and I hit the hay and zonked out immediately. My housemate stayed up in bed to read for a bit with just her bedside light on. She was doing that for just over an hour before she heard this weird scritch scratch on the front window of her bedroom. Initially, she put it down to an overhanging tree branch. That was until she realized there was no overhanging tree branch. She sat frozen in fear, blankly staring at her book for what felt like an eternity. 
until she heard the noise again and again. Slowly looking up, she saw a dude wearing a hoodie trying to open her window, looking her dead in the eyes while he did it. She screamed, jumped out of bed, and ran straight into my room. I woke up super dazed as she was pulling my hand and whisper yelling that someone was trying to break in. She had a tendency to be a little overdramatic sometimes, but I swear I've never seen somebody look so genuinely terrified. I went to grab my phone to call the cops, but we just went completely still when we heard the distinct crunch, crunch of someone walking down the side path of the house. We both rolled off my bed onto the floor and went completely still. The crunching continued, getting closer and closer to my bedroom window. I don't know what it was about that distinct sound in the middle of the night when it's otherwise quiet, but it was like it was deafening. And that's when I realized why it was so loud. My window was wide open. I jumped up, slid the window down, and slammed the lock shut just as he reached it. He looked at me, but he didn't react at all. He just calmly tried to open the window, but when he realized he couldn't, he continued down the pathway to the backyard. I was thoroughly losing my mind now, and my housemate was sobbing on the floor, looking up at me like a bunny about to be torn apart by a fox. I sprinted to the back door to thankfully find it locked, I ran back to my room and called the cops. I don't know what the cops knew that we didn't, but they must have broken a land speed record to arrive all of three minutes later, lights and sirens off. We saw them go down the side path, guns drawn, straight to the backyard. There were some noises from the yard, then a knock at the back door a moment later, and the police identified themselves. Turns out the dude had vaulted the back fence, quite an impressive feat, and another patrol car was headed to the next street over to look for him. The two cops at our place asked if we were okay, and then asked if they could come in and look around. Honestly, these cops were amazing. They managed to calm us down whilst making sure that the place was safe, and I was really impressed with how they handled the situation. I offered them a cuppa, which they politely declined, and then they took our statements and asked if there was anybody we could stay with that night. My housemate and I stayed at her boyfriend's place for a few nights after that, and when we stayed at the house, it was just never the same. We felt completely violated, and we ended up moving out a few weeks later. We never did find out if that guy was caught, but there was a random stabbing a few nights after the incident at a train station two streets over. If it was related or not, I don't really know, but all I can think is we were so lucky that that went the way it did. So it's 7 a.m. and I'm idling in a McDonald's parking lot until sunrise. The past few days with an escalating prowler have finally driven me out of my home. I'm a 25-year-old female and I live alone, on the ground floor of some cute condos with lovely neighbors. I work nights, but with the pandemic work has been seldom. Naturally, I'm used to staying up late. Four nights ago at 2.30 in the morning, I'm watching TV in the living room, and my dog starts growling at the window. She only does this when someone or something is on my patio, and usually it's a cat or a raccoon. I assumed it was an animal outside, until I heard what sounded like somebody trying to open my door. I sat still and listened for more noise, because I just couldn't believe that that was happening. I called my mom because I was feeling weirded out, and then I peeked through my blinds, all of which were closed by the way, to see the gate to my patio is wide open. I know I shut it, and the wind has never blown it open. I'm still on the phone with my mom, and I get the genius idea to go show whoever it is that I'm not scared, and go latch my gate while making my presence known. I go outside, and there's a man on the walkway near my patio entrance. He was walking away until he heard my door open. 
He fully turns around to face me and stops, staring. Average looking white guy, hoodie up, hands in his pocket, no bag. Strange, as I first assumed it was just a patio thief. But when he turned around and looked at me, I got a chill. Why would this thief show me his face and make a point of fully turning to face me and stare? I'm shocked, and I begin walking backwards toward my door to go inside. He turns back around and keeps walking away. He takes three steps, then fully turns around again and stops to stare at me. I went inside and stayed on the phone for a couple of hours until I finally fell asleep. I called the non-emergency police and they made a note. After that first weird encounter, I put a long and low to the ground flower pot against my patio gate so it would make a noise if somebody opened it. A couple of nights pass and I didn't notice anyone creeping about. Until last night. Last night at about 1 a.m., I hear a crashing noise. Again, I call my mom for reassurance and I look around the house to see if anything had fallen. I think it must be nothing and I get off the phone. And that is when I suddenly remember my DIY flower pot alarm. I peek through the blinds to see, yet again, my gate is open and the flower pot was knocked over. He came back. I called the non-emergency police line again, and this time they came and did a patrol of the neighborhood, but they didn't catch him. Fast forward to tonight's incident. Needless to say, I'm thoroughly creeped out. I find a deal on some security cameras with motion detecting capabilities. I got to Best Buy just before closing and snagged the last pair in stock. I set those bad boys up and felt pretty safe. 1 a.m. again. I'm running a bath, on the phone with my boyfriend, and I get a motion detected alert from my security cameras. I assume it's just a cat, because I didn't hear the gate crash. I had reset the flower pot system after it was knocked over the previous night. To my horror, I see a man tiptoeing from the side of my patio toward my door, hoodie up, hands in pockets. He knew not to use the gate because it made a noise last night. It was him. He wiggles my door handle. I'm absolutely terrified because he's right there. He's back again. I throw on a long coat and run into the lobby barefoot and call 911. My boyfriend got there before the police did and was running through the back with a baseball bat looking for this creep. Unfortunately for me, and lucky for him, he didn't find him. The police didn't find him either. So, I'm sitting here at a McDonald's in the parking lot at 7 a.m., scared to go home. It's just all too creepy, and I know to trust my gut. Why would he turn around and stare the first time? Why would he come back after he knew that I saw him? Why is he so determined to be here? I mean, he hopped the fence to avoid the loud noise of the gate and flower pot. What scares me most is how persistent and undeterred he seems by all of it. What will stop him? What's his end game? Nothing is missing from my patio. Frankly, there's nothing to steal. He never had a backpack or any kind of bag, just hands in his pockets. I have him trying the door tonight on video, so hopefully that will help him get caught. I just wish I understood the psychology of guys like this. I mean, honestly, what can I do? I'm staying at a friend's house for a few days and I'll be monitoring the cameras closely. This happened four years back. I was about 14 years old, and my parents were out and had left me and my little sister, who was 10, home alone. It was about 10 or 11 p.m. when the lights go out. This used to happen sometimes in my country, since it's a newer country and we're really poor. But that time, I noticed something out of the ordinary. Only the lights in our house were out. My neighbor's lights were on. I had a really bad feeling, so I quickly locked all the doors and closed the blinds. 
I told my little sister to hide behind the couch and to not go out whatever happened. I hid somewhere else with a knife and tried to call my mom. She didn't pick up, so I waited. I thought it was over, so I get out of my hiding place and I head to the kitchen, where we had the back door, to go look out the window. Before I get close, I hear the doorknob turning. It doesn't work, so the person on the other side now tries violently to open the door. That's when I panicked and shouted, Who are you? Get the F away from my house. I've called the police. I hear footsteps and then nothing. I went to the other room and looked out the window and I saw somebody running out of my backyard. My sister was crying, so I comforted her while we stayed hidden until my parents came home after about an hour. We told them everything, and my dad said that whoever it was, he had intentionally cut the house's electricity to scare us. To this day, every single time the electricity goes out, I get kind of scared. I'm just really glad we're okay. In the summer of 2020, my friends Alex and Violet and I decided to go on a mountain vacation. COVID cabin fever had hit us hard and we were desperate to get out. We settled on a mountain estate and planned to camp and hike at several different locations. For one night, we thought it would be fun to book a cabin in the woods. Violet's parents had rented a fire tower once and loved it but a cabin beside a fire tower wall was all we could find. It was cheap, clean, and secluded. Excited to have a night where we could be as obnoxious as we wanted, we booked it. In the weeks leading up to the trip, we decided that it would just be a great idea to drop acid at the cabin. Violet bought an entire sheet in preparation for our arrival, and it was tucked into her bag as we pulled out of the driveway to make our way to the cabin. I remember having this unusual knot in the pit of my stomach, this aching feeling that gnawed at me. I told Alex and Violet that there was no way we could drop acid that night. Violet was pissed. We turned around and got into a massive argument, but I stood my ground. I just knew that we had no business doing that that night. Couldn't explain it, I just knew. Finally, the fireworks settled and we were off. The cabin was roughly 30 minutes away from the nearest town. It sat atop a mountain. We held our breath as we rounded the busted road that spiraled toward the top. There were no pull-offs, no other campsites. Just a long winding road that led us to the cabin at the peak. We settled in and started a fire to keep warm. As dusk gave way to night, we heard the unmistakable noise of an engine on the road, then the flash of headlights. A side-by-side -side with three kids arrived, and our nerves settled. They smiled, gave us a wave, climbed the fire tower, and left. We had heard that there may be occasional visitors to the fire tower, but they were the only ones who had come by. We doused the fire and moved inside, heated some hot dogs until they were lukewarm, ate them fast, and sat in the silence. You don't know how quiet it is until you're in the middle of nowhere. You can hear every rustle of the leaves, the whisper of the wind through their branches. You get so used to white noise living in the city. There's always the hum of an air conditioner or the dim roar of traffic to focus on. Here. The closest thing to white noise was the sound of our own breathing. We jumped at every noise, too frightened to speak to one another, and finally I had had enough. I cracked a few wine coolers, passed them to Alex and Violet, and then slapped a board game down on the table between our bunk beds. It didn't take long for us to loosen, and we were laughing, having the raucous good time that we had envisioned. Much soberer than we'd thought, but still, it was enough that we were able to ignore the rumble of the woods. Later, we'd all recall hearing noises in the background, the snap of a twig, the dim rumble of an engine. 
None of us wanted to rupture the air of nonchalance between us, so we had all collectively ignored it. Until a human hand reached up to the window between us and slapped it three times. We were screaming in an instant. Alex called 911, put them on speakerphone, and handed his cell to me. He grabbed pokers from the fireplace and passed them out. Violet started calling family members and saying her last goodbyes. I held my breath and listened for any more noise. Whoever this was, whatever this was, would have had to have heard us call 911. And now they were being careful to make a silent retreat. Dispatch arrived 20 minutes later, a lucky thing for a 1 a.m. emergency call, and had their dogs comb the mountain. Nothing. They suggested that it may have been a bear, but I could tell from their faces that they didn't believe that for a second. Neither did we. We'd barely cooked those hot dogs, and why would a bear smack the window by a couple of screaming kids, rather than the one closest to the pan that we had used to cook? Why would the bear knock on the window like a human? And why, when we screamed, did the bear make a stealthy retreat? They had no answers, but they had one anecdote. As they had sped to us, they had come across a car at the base of the mountain, but that was the only life that they had seen. I remember my blood ran cold, but Violet and Alex were too frazzled to absorb the weight of what they had said and dizzied by a new horror. Violet's car, thoroughly dusted by our drive up the mountain, was covered in handprints. Handprints that didn't match ours, that touched places we hadn't. We grabbed our things by the armful and threw it inside, eager to remove every part of ourselves from this mountain. We followed the police, grateful that every pothole found us farther and farther from that wretched cabin. We made it down in record time, and found lodging at a seedy hotel that reeked of cat pee. I couldn't sleep. The thought of that car on the road rang in my head. Remember, there was nothing else on that mountain. It was a narrow road to the top. No pull-offs, no other campsites. There was the fire tower. Maybe a visitor decided to spook us during their late night excursion. But the kids from earlier, we had seen their headlights. Whoever did this had stopped their vehicle farther down the road and then hiked the rest of the way. They didn't want to be spotted. They wanted silence and secrecy. Whoever this was hadn't been looking for a cheap scare. They had planned it. I don't think I'll ever know what the person on the mountain wanted from us. I don't know if it was a practical joke or the beginning of a night of terror. I'm grateful for Alex's quick wit in calling 911. I wonder if our visitor knew that we had service. It had certainly been a welcome surprise to us. Perhaps that was a wrench in the plan, enough to spook the person before they could make things ugly. In truth, I don't know if I want to know. I'm just really glad that nothing else happened and that we were able to get off that mountain. This past New Year's was mine and my boyfriend's four-year anniversary. We typically don't do much, so this year we decided to make it special by planning a romantic getaway. At the time, the two of us were living in Seattle and wanted to rent a cabin in a snowy small town for the weekend. We found an Airbnb with a hot tub and we were sold. The cabin was, of course, the last house on the road. To get to it, you had to drive down a small removed private road that ended in a roundabout. Off the roundabout was a long uphill driveway leading to our cabin. We got to the cabin and it was snowy and beautiful. The cabin itself sat on top of a garage and you needed to take stairs on the back side of the property to get to the front door. When we got inside, there was a booklet with all of the cabin's info outlined. The book said that during the snowy season, 
don't be surprised if their contracted snowplowers showed up to clear off the driveway. Okay, sounds good. We unpacked and realized that there was no service on either of our phones, but the booklet told us there was a landline in the cabin if we needed anything. We spent the first night by the fire, playing board games and drinking wine. The weekend was exactly what we needed. We planned to spend the next day in town, and that night, I had booked us a reservation for a nice dinner. We were gone almost all day, only returning briefly to get dressed up and enjoy some good food. Dinner was great, and we were excited to head back to the cabin for some champagne hot tubbing. While at dinner, the temperature had dropped and it snowed for the first time that day, coating everything in a fresh layer of powder. We drove down the private road and got to the driveway. At that point, my boyfriend stopped the car, headlights shining in front, and asked if I noticed the new tire tracks. I looked at the driveway, hoping to quickly disregard the new tire tracks, but there they were. Immediately, we remembered that the snowplowers could have stopped by, but the issue was we saw the tire tracks because of the snow, and who plows in the dark? We also knew that once we were at the cabin, we had no service on our cell phones, so we figured that we would head back into town and message our Airbnb hosts and ask them if them or one of their friends had stopped by the apartments. We waited for a while in town for a reply from our hosts, but didn't tear back. We could have called at that point, but it was past 10 and we didn't want to be bad guests. We figured we blew the whole thing out of proportion and might as well head back to the cabin. After all, I am big into true crime, spooky subreddits, and horror movies, so I figured I was probably just psyching myself out. My boyfriend drove us back and this time we actually drove up the driveway. Toward the top of the hill, I noticed something. My stomach dropped as I noticed footprints on the property. We backed down the driveway and took a closer look to see if there were more footprints. From what it looked like, someone had driven up the driveway, reversed down, parked, and then got out of the car and walked onto the property. Since we had now also driven on the tracks, we couldn't find where the footprints ended. The property was quite large, with tons of trees and brush, and we knew that these footprints could go anywhere. The moment we saw footprints, we decided to call the police. We figured it was better safe than sorry. We would just have the officer go onto the property with us to check everything out. We drove down the road until we had service, called the police, and waited for their arrival. The policeman showed up and we followed him onto the property. The police officer scanned the property and determined that there was nobody out there. Obviously, we were a little shaken up and a lot embarrassed, but we thanked the officer as he left. Needless to say, neither of us wanted to sit in the hot tub in the dark woods after what we'd seen. Instead, we locked the doors and watched a movie, champagneless. We were both tired from the day and we passed out pretty quickly. At 3 a.m. we both woke up on the couch with the TV on and all the lights, laughing about how the night hadn't turned out quite as planned. As my boyfriend went to brush his teeth, we heard a noise. It sounded mechanical and it only lasted a few seconds. We looked at each other and froze. The garage door. There are very few reasons that somebody would need to open the garage door of a guest-occupied Airbnb at 3 in the morning. Like I said, we woke up to all of our lights on, and the cabin had lots of windows. We knew that if somebody was outside, they knew we were there, and they could see us. I immediately grabbed the landline and dialed 911. We sat crouched in the Airbnb, praying for the police to arrive. We knew that whoever had made those tracks was still on the property, and this time they were making noise. As I sat talking to the operator, we heard a bang on our balcony, as if somebody had thrown something up onto it. I was losing my absolute mind when the operator told me that the police were nearby. 
All of a sudden, they were there. We saw the police lights and watched them search the property. Soon we heard banging on the door. It was the police. We were okay. At the door were two policemen, one right in front of us and one a little bit behind, kind of kicking around snow and looking at the ground. I immediately noticed that the police officer in the back was the one that had done the initial check on the property. The police officer told us that not only was the garage door shut, but it was locked, and again, there were no signs of somebody on the property. We discussed leaving, but the police officer said that the road conditions were too dangerous at that time of night. I looked over at the police officer, who had to come out to the property twice, and I felt that I had deeply disappointed him. My boyfriend and I went back inside, again locking all the doors, and tried to sleep. The next day, we were leaving, and while we survived the night, I didn't feel right in the cabin anymore. It was forever the spooky cabin in my head, and I wanted to leave. As we packed, we heard the same noise that we had heard at 3 a.m. It turns out it was the heater, a heater that sounded just like the garage and lasted for the same duration. My boyfriend looked at me and immediately said, you really need to give up your murder shows, and walked away, as if. As for the banging on the balcony, it was just the perfectly timed fall of a pine cone. A really big pine cone. I promise I'm not paranoid. I think back on this story a lot, and I'm very embarrassed about how little came of it, but also incredibly grateful for the same reason. But, still, somebody drove onto that property and walked around. And that part still deeply unsettles me. It was about late November in Colorado, and I was about seven or eight years old. My father got the idea of taking us all for a weekend to a cabin that he was going to rent. My mother thought that it was a great idea for me, my sister, my father, and my mother to all bond. So that's exactly what happened. We rented a cabin for a few days. We took off school on Friday to get a head start on getting there, which I had no issue with. We got there and it was really cold. Well, it was almost December, so I guess it made sense that it was so cold. Anyway, we got all set up and decided where we would all sleep. We ate dinner, and then we all got set up for bed, and were thinking about what we would do the next day. We got there kind of late, so we couldn't do much on that first day. That night, though, I heard noises outside. It sounded kind of like footsteps. I looked out the window and saw nothing, so I figured it must have just been an animal. I tried to go back to sleep, but then about 15 minutes later I heard it again. I woke my sister up, she was about 11 at the time, and she heard it as well. We both walked over to the window and saw something out there, but we weren't quite sure what it was. We decided that it would be best for it to not see us, so we went back to sleep. I had a really hard time sleeping that night, and so did my sister. But when we eventually woke up after somehow falling asleep, my mother was inside making breakfast and my father was outside. I asked my mom if I could go outside with my dad and she said sure while my sister stayed inside and waited for my mother to finish breakfast. I walked outside and my father was talking to some man, a short chubby man. He had a shaved head and was wearing a veteran cap. He looked really nervous too, for some reason. He was sweating a lot as well, even though it was freezing outside. I walked over to him and my father. My father looked at me and said, oh, this is my son and told him my name. The man looked at me and said, Nice to meet you, kid. Name's Patrick. He smiled and looked at me. I smiled and greeted him back. And it may have been rude at the time, but I was just a kid, so I asked him, You look kind of scared. Are you alright? 
and he kind of coughed and replied with, Yeah, I'm fine. I uh, just went through shell shock. I'm a veteran. He said this, as though I couldn't tell already with the cap he was wearing. But he seemed normal after that. My father seemed to really like this guy, and I liked him too, at first. He told my father that he had also rented a cabin with his family, and that they were really close to us, so he had decided to introduce himself. My father invited him inside for breakfast, and he stayed, and it was normal. I went outside to play after that with my father and Patrick. While outside, I fell and scraped my knee and started crying. My father was inside at the time, a bad time for him to be inside. My mother was calling for him and he ran inside while I was out there with Patrick, alone. Patrick ran over to me and told me to come with him to his cabin because he had band-aids. I agreed and went with him. I wasn't a very smart kid. I went with Patrick and we talked about what I liked doing and I told him about the video games that I played and stuff like that. Then things got weird. He asked me what shoe size I was and how old I am. I didn't know what my shoe size was, I told him, but I told him my age. He just kind of chuckled and said something like, good to know. Also, his cabin was nowhere near ours. It was way back. It took about 20 to 25 minutes to walk there. I was tired and there was no point in getting the band-aid anymore but I still decided to keep going since I had walked so long. When we entered the cabin, he told me to go first, so I did. As soon as I walked in, I realized something. There was nobody in there, no family. I asked him where his family was and he didn't answer, pretending like he hadn't heard me. He locked the door and then I got kind of scared. He said, I'll be right back with the band-aid, kiddo. He walked into the kitchen and pulled one out of somewhere and then walked back and told me to have a seat and he would put it on. I sat down and he put it on me. He also held my leg with his other hand and kept rubbing it and said, you're a rather muscular kid. I like that. Obviously, I got kind of scared and immediately stood up. He asked me what was wrong, and I told him nothing, that my leg was feeling so much better. I then thought that my parents must be worried sick about me and that I should hurry back. He insisted that I stayed a little bit longer and that I ate there. I didn't want to, but I was alone. And if I ran, I didn't think I could find my way back to the cabin. The door was locked, so I just agreed and decided to eat with him and get it over with. He asked how much I weighed. I guessed and said about 73 pounds. He smiled, nodded, and said, perfect weight. I said, perfect for what? But he just kept smiling. I was really weirded out and asked him if I could go. He told me no, that things were just getting started and I shouldn't miss out on the fun. He had such a weird tone when he said it too. Then I heard a big bang come from the bedroom. It was a closed door. Patrick stood up and looked kind of angry. He walked into the room and shut the door behind him. I then heard him yelling, did I effing tell you that you could move? No, stay the F where you are. I have company. He then walked out with a smile on his face and shut the door slowly. Sorry about that, it was just my wife. She's really sick and not allowed to be near visitors today. He was smiling while he said that. I wanted to go. I then looked around the room and noticed that there were clothes everywhere and it was really messy. He must have been living out here. At that moment, his wife walked out of the room. I'm hungry, she said. He looked pissed. Get back in there. His wife was extremely pale and looked like she'd been crying a lot. She was sniffing and had red circles under her eyes. She looked at me and then just walked back into the room. I asked him where his kids were. He didn't answer. 
He told me that he had kids clothes that he wanted me to try on, and that was the last straw. I knew I had to get out of that situation, but I didn't know how. I started crying, and then he hugged me, and he said, it'll be okay, little one. Nothing's gonna happen. Just try on these clothes. He walked into the back room, and I thought that that was the perfect time for me to leave. I unlocked his door and tried to leave as quietly as I could. I didn't care if I got lost anymore. I didn't want to take any more chances with Patrick, if that was even his name. I had a feeling that he had been lying. I mean, he lied about having kids, so who knows what else. I was in the woods trying to find my way back. I was still kind of close to his house, close enough to hear the shouting. I heard him yelling stuff to his wife, things along the lines of, where the F did he go? I knew I shouldn't have left him alone. You probably let him leave. I could have sworn I heard him call her a couple of pretty awful names. And then it happened. I stopped in my tracks. I heard footsteps. I went and hid behind a tree and I looked in his direction. He was outside and seemed to be looking for me. I was far enough away to where I could barely see him, but I could tell he was looking for something. He then stepped out into the forest and I heard him shouting, Hey kid, it's okay. You can come back now. You don't have to try on the clothes. And I have toys back in my cabin. All you have to do is come back. And then I ran. I ran as fast as I could in a straight line in hopes to find somebody in my family. I was running away and I thought I heard shouting, but I didn't stop to see what it was saying. Then after about an hour of running, I finally saw a cabin, my cabin. I ran to it. My father was outside looking around, looking for me. I ran up to him crying and told him Patrick wasn't a good guy, that he was really weird and was touching my legs and stuff. That's when my father immediately called the person he had rented the cabin from. The owner said he had nobody staying at that cabin. My father looked at me and told me to never follow any stranger ever again. We immediately left that day and asked for a refund for the next day. The guy renting them out apologized. The man that had the cabin rentals called the police, and the police went back there and checked the cabin, but there was nobody there, not even his wife. His clothes and belongings were still there, though. Nothing really happened after that. They asked us questions and left. They never called us or told us anything about him ever again. Patrick most likely wasn't his real name, and he probably wasn't a veteran. I just really want to know what happened to him and his wife, and how he even got a wife in the first place, if she was his wife, and why they had lived back in that cabin. He seemed to have lived there for a while. I guess he left because he figured the police would be coming after him because he didn't rent the cabin. So many questions that I'll never get answered. I'm just really glad it's all over, and I'm really glad I got out of there. This happened back one summer when I was about 12 or 13, before cell phones were common. My mother rented a cabin that we could stay at about four hours north of our home. My father couldn't attend due to the fact that he was working, but that was fine with him. We drove up to the cabin, which was literally just a 15 by 15 foot room with an attached bathroom, just enough for a bed, a table, and a small TV and it was cute enough from the outside. There were several cookie cutter cabins you could rent, I think seven in total, that all arced around in a C shape with parking spots in front and at the front of the line of the cabins was where the owner of the cabin stayed in the front desk area, if you will. Anyway, when we first arrived, we were the only people there. No other cabins had been rented out. Even though it was August, in this area, Although semi-remote, is a tourist destination. It's in northern Michigan. 
The gentleman that worked at the front desk and owned the cabins came out to greet us. I didn't pay too much attention due to the fact that I was 12 and excited for the fun outdoors adventures that my mother and I were going to have. Climbing the dunes, eating ice cream, swimming, having campfires, all the good stuff. Well, I remember him giving my mom the key and saying, the bathroom window is broken and doesn't close all the way, nor does it lock. Which, if we were the only people living there, why not give us a room in which the bathroom did lock? We thought it was kind of strange, but shrugged it off. After a day of adventure, we went out, came back at dusk, and went to bed. The next morning, Saturday, we woke up and went to get into the truck, but it wouldn't start. Strange, I will admit, at the time it was a newer SUV. I don't recall what was wrong with it, but I remember the owner of the cabins coming out and being like, Oh, your truck is broke? That's too bad, let me call someone. My mom insisted that she could call somebody, went into his office, used his phone, and called somebody to come and fix it. As we were waiting for someone to get there, the owner came out and said, did you guys have any problems with the power last night? My mom and I kind of shook our heads, confused. Oh, uh, well, sometimes in that cabin, the power will randomly go out, but all you have to do is come out here and flip the breaker. He then proceeded to show my mother where the breaker was, which happened to be outside of the cabin, behind it, on a pole. After getting the truck fixed and having another day of adventure, we came back ready to settle in for the night. As we were sitting in bed watching TV, the power went out. It didn't flicker, just boom, out. My mom grabbed a flashlight she had packed, and we went out there and turned the breaker back on. At this point, we were feeling incredibly uneasy, like anybody would be. We got back in bed, and about 10 minutes later, the power went out again. My mom jumped up and ran outside, only to see a man which I assume was the owner because nobody else was there, running away from the fuse box. We hightailed it out of there so fast. Luckily, everything had been packed because we were leaving the next day. But still, that guy was creepy. In college, I would go home every other weekend to work at the job I had had since high school. I would drive directly from campus after my last class on Friday to my job, about an hour, and after my shift was done, I'd go back to my parents' house, which was out in the middle of nowhere. My parents weren't yet home when I got back from work. They often spent their Friday and Saturday evenings drinking like they were the ones in college. So the house was dark, and since it was mid-fall, so was the yard, save for the yard light. I pulled into my normal parking spot, got out of the car, and then turned to open the back door of my car and get my backpack out of the back seat. That's when I noticed that the bathroom light was on. Was that light on when I pulled up? It must have been, right? As I was contemplating the light and reaching for my backpack, there was suddenly a very angry looking woman standing in the window staring at me. We're not talking rusting bitch face here either. She was pissed off at me and I knew it. We stood there staring at each other for a good 10 seconds when my parents pulled into the driveway and distracted me from my stare down with the woman in the bathroom. By the time I turned back, the light was still on, but the woman was gone. We never saw her again. help breaking this down and I need to feel like I'm not crazy. I'm a court clerk. I work for my local courthouse. I work both in the office and in court and I split my time about half and half. On a Friday in April, I was in the office at my desk. 
I sometimes also assist customers who come into our office who have questions on certain types of filings. I'm the backup coverage, specifically for our records window. In my state, we are considered public records. Anyone can come in and request copies from any case, unless it's juvenile, confidential, or sealed by the court. I was asked to cover the records desk from 4 to 4.30 p.m. on this Friday, so our records clerk could leave a little bit early. No problem. I have no issues helping out when I can. Around 4.15, we had a frequent flyer, as we have so dubbed them. This man comes in frequently to get copies of his case. I should really note the way my office is set up because it is a bit important. We are set up kind of like the DMV. You have to come into the main entrance of security, go down a long hallway, and it opens up to a lobby. There are elevators straight ahead, and the DA's office is to the left, and the clerk of courts, or COC, where I work, is to the right. You have to open a separate set of doors into our little lobby. There's a counter with windows, and it's an L shape. The records window is around the corner, tucked in the back. There are also three public terminals where any member of the public can use to research cases in my county. So back to the man. We'll call him Joe. Joe has an open family case. He comes in probably once a week to get copies out of his family's case. Or whatever he's doing. I don't really know and it's none of my business, but I assume that's what he's doing. He came up to my window somewhere around 4.15 to 4.20 and said that he requested some documents. When documents are requested from the public terminals, they go to a queue, which I then go into and select them to print. I went into the queue, glanced at the document, and asked, Did you have 11 pages? He said yes, so I selected and printed. I wrote him a little slip out with a number of copies and his total owed. I gave him the slip, directed him to go back to the windows 4 through 5 for cashiers for payment, and that I would meet him there. I went to grab the copies off the printer, which jammed. I messed with that for a minute, counted the pages and took them to the cashier. Then I went back to my counter to help the next person in line. The next customer was easy. Her records were prepaid and printed. After the second customer, it was after 425. My coworker Lynn asked me if I wanted to go thrifting for clothes at Plato's closet after work. And my answer was, hell yeah, let's go. Right as we're discussing this, I'm in view of the records window, but not at it. I saw that Joe had returned to the counter. I went up to the counter and I asked how I could help him. He stated, you must be new. I'm not new. I've been at my job for almost four years and in the legal field for almost 10. I replied, no, I'm not. How can I help? He then made a comment about a paperweight I was using. It was a gift from my niece, a painted rock from a three-year-old. That's a fancy paperweight you have there. Sir, what can I do for you? You gave me the wrong case. No, sir. I printed off what was in the queue. So you don't need these four pages? I tossed the four pages and then adjusted his slip, seven pages total, and I sent him back to the cashier. At this point, it's 4.30, it's Friday, and we're closed. I left and headed to Plato's closet. It took me about 15 minutes to drive over there. I sat in my car for a few minutes and then went inside. I beat Lynn there, so I started browsing. She came in a couple of minutes later, stating that she got caught behind a train, so we start shopping and chatting. For some reason, I looked at the door when it opened. There was Joe. Now, I knew it was Joe because he wears that dumb sock monkey hat. I saw him and got Lynn's attention. Um, are you seeing what I'm seeing? So I pulled Lynn into an aisle and we ducked down. She's short. I'm tall and I wear heels a lot. I could watch his dumb hat around the store. He immediately went to the back of the store. And he looked like he was rubbernecking it the whole time. So he goes to the back of the store grabs a pair of shoes, glances at them, and continues looking around. I continued to watch him, and as he moved, we moved opposite. We were legitimately hiding behind the clothing racks. 
He moved around the perimeter of the store, continuing to just gawk around, looking for something or someone. He finally leaves, and we freak out. We check the parking lot to make sure he's gone. We try and shake it off and just chalk it up to coincidence. And then I realized that we were talking about it literally in front of him. And Lynn, she's not quiet. She gets scolded on a weekly basis for her loud carrying voice. I told the cashiers what happened, just in case it was something to worry about. And we ended up leaving like an hour later. The next day, I felt so uneasy about it. I called my boss and told her what happened and told her that I thought about calling the police, the non-emergency number. I did and I left a message with dispatch. I got a call from an officer a few hours later and I explained what happened. He said to get Joe's name. At this point, I recognized him but didn't know his name offhand. And he told me that he would call me back on Wednesday when he was back on duty. I got Joe's name and called the officer back on Monday and left a voicemail. Monday was fine. Tuesday, I was out of the office. But Wednesday? Joe came back on Wednesday. He came in at 4.20 to file documents into his case. He took 20 minutes to file two affidavits and a motion. For reference, it should have been like a minute. Two, because he needed something notarized. He left and I just had a bad feeling. I called the officer and told him what happened. The officer said that if he comes back Thursday to call and they would come down to talk to him. The police department is across the street from the courthouse. Thursday rolls around, no Joe, until 425. He beelined it for the computer in the corner. I messaged my boss. We had already put into place a safety plan. The sheriff's deputies who work security were notified. Three deputies followed him into my office. I called the PD. Two officers came down and they questioned him. He admitted to being at Plato's closet. He said he was shopping for his two young daughters, nine and 11. Problem is they don't fit into clothes at Plato's yet. Plato's has a sister store, once upon a child. Those kids don't really fit there either. So he had a receipt in his car for once upon a child for 5.07 PM. He denied hearing my conversation with Lynn regarding going to Plato's after work. He stated he left my office at 4.15 and took his children shopping for clothes. He did not have his children with him at the courthouse or at Plato's. He also asked the officer immediately and unprompted, did she call you? He also stated that he believed his ex-wife was setting him up. So because my office is a public office and he has arguably legitimate reasons to come into my office, there's really nothing the officers can do. They issued him an oral warning and put him on standby. The kicker is he could opt into his case electronically, but he made this big deal about not being able to opt in a few months ago. We told him if he was having issues, he could call the court support line and they would be able to fix the situation. Instead, he chooses to come in and pay $1.25 a page instead of a one-time $20 fee. Apparently, he also paid that. If you weren't already freaked out, last year, his roommate filed a restraining order against him, followed by his roommate's girlfriend alleging sexual harassment. I won't go into details regarding the family's case, but let's just say it's more than messy. He's also filing extremely high level types of documents for being somebody representing himself. Today, I was in court all day, came down to my desk at around 4.05 PM, and he came in at about 4.10 PM. I left while he was still at my office. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. The officers can't do anything else. I need another incident outside of my office to file a restraining order. I have ordered home security. I signed up for self-defense classes and I'm purchasing mace. I don't know what else to do. This happened a couple of years ago when I was around 13 to 14 years old. I would go to Nerf Wars with my friends during the weekends with a semi-auto rifle and one of those revolver-looking pistols as a sidearm. On one of those occasions, 
I brought my girlfriend to the Nerf War with me. For some context, my girlfriend's my neighbor. She lives in the same area I do, and we've known each other for some time, since around preschool, I think. As you do for a Nerf War, you pack up spare darts, spare mags, etc. So the Nerf War ended and we had a great time as usual, and we went our separate ways. As my girlfriend and I start walking back home, my paranoia kind of kicks in, and I have a feeling that someone is following us. I glanced back slightly, and there was a guy in full black. At first I thought it was just one of my friends awkwardly following us, but then I remembered that none of them were wearing full plain black that day, so I turn back to my girlfriend and tell her that I think we're being followed. She glances back slightly and sees the same guy. She starts panicking, so I tell her to calm down. It's probably just some guy going to the subway as well. So we get on the train, hoping that the man would stop following us. As I'm making sure my rifle isn't bothering anyone, I didn't have space to store my Nerf rifle even when it was taken apart, so I just had it slung around my waist. I feel my girlfriend's grip on my hand tighten. Then she whispers, telling me that the man was on the train as well and was staring at us. At this point, I'd had enough of this guy's crap. I was tired, and the last thing I needed was some dude stalking my girlfriend and I. Luckily, our stop was two stations away, so when we got there, we bounced right out of that car. I looked back, and the man was indeed behind us. We get up to the streets, hoping that there would be at least someone or some sort of camera that would be able to see my girlfriend and I. But the streets were basically empty, with only a couple of people going back home. My girlfriend was trembling beside me, scared as all hell. I told her my plan, and with some hesitancy, she agreed to it. I stopped moving to take a drink of water, my girlfriend shifting her hand toward my leg so it wouldn't be as obvious. It was dark at the time. I felt her hand being ripped away from my leg, and I heard her terrified screams. I decided to grab the closest weapon I had on me, the stock of my Nerf rifle. The stocks attached to Nerf guns with two clips latching onto them, so it wouldn't take long to pull it on or off. My stock was pretty big. It wasn't metal, but it was a solid piece of plastic that could do some damage to someone's face. I whacked the guy around the face, grabbed my girlfriend's hand, and got out of there. We waved down the closest taxi, got on, and sighed happy that we weren't being followed by some guy. I don't talk about this incident much, but I just wanted to share it and get it off my chest. Because of that incident, I stopped playing Nerf for a while. My Nerf's been stored in my Nerf armory for a couple of years, untouched. Every time I think of it, this incident comes to mind. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent, because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything, so I guess I'm just going to start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers, just in case I ever needed anything, and I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. 
I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names, and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day, I went out to my car and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car, and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me inviting me over and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts. Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it, twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew he made me uncomfortable. I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is he didn't deny any of it. 
Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So, in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is, until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there, going outside and screaming nonsense, things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard and now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just wanna live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me, where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them. So maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired, I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted.
First off, I just want to say that this has been ongoing for years. We were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. I'm 18 now, and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13-year-old's perspective, and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center, as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot, who is a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it, and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields, until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn, so instead of passing through the gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still staring at us. I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first and I had no idea how long he'd been there. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. All the while we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? 
At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing. But that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. This particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing, like 14-year-olds do, when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around, and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled. And that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl. We realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided, screw it, and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil, leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us, so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with, and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside, thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, there's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot. The ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us, and that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night we went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints. Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree. I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. 
This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridle path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile and I knew what it was immediately. Death, literal rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in a search. Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're going to find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes, implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods? Anyway, Ryan is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. He didn't throw it out. He buried it. What the fuck? We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan and no one else believed us, so why would the police? 
This is, unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it, nor will we know why he followed us all those years, trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy the story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name. But I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there but there's something really off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, 
A propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me unless he's called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife starts jogging at me and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path, pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened, and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can, some coins, and keys from our truck, and zip-tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken, and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough it was tied at roughly the same height, about 8 to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 hunted documentary and I noticed the clusters smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there, at that place, that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit. This story happens in the Latin American country I was living in at the time, 
I was a 22 to 23 year old female finishing my master's degree in the local university. I had a part-time job as a receptionist in an institute, and usually I had the afternoon shift. I left work every day at about 8.30 p.m. to go to the bus stop, then walk like five minutes to get home from there. Even though this is and was one of the most dangerous countries in the world, I lived in a relatively safe city in a good neighborhood. Still, I walked very alert of my surroundings and I was ready to run and call for someone if needed. This is where my story starts. For a few days, I had been seeing this very big, expensive white SUV with tinted windows driving around my neighborhood. I'd never seen it before, but I just thought it was a new neighbor. After a few days, I started noticing that the SUV seemed to follow me. It was always parked in a corner of my street and usually started driving when I walked past it. Obviously, this gave me the creeps, so I told my boyfriend and my parents. Since the driver never did anything, just drove, not even slowly at times, they said it could be a coincidence and it could be, in fact, a neighbor. What started as nighttime encounters that went on for several weeks, but not on a regular basis, turned into daytime encounters. This SUV started to follow me around the neighborhood, sometimes passing by me fast several times in a row, sometimes slow, almost at the same speed I was walking. I discreetly took note of the license plate and always kept it in my phone, as it was a popular year model SUV. I started to look for it everywhere I went, and I noticed that they followed me to other parts of the city. This really freaked me out, and I finally contacted the police. I didn't do it before because they're mostly useless. They, of course, told me that they couldn't do anything about it unless it was physical. Otherwise, they could assume that it was just a coincidence. I was in panic mode. I even dreamed about this situation. I alerted my parents, my boyfriend who was working in another city, friends and coworkers. I even told my boss and surprisingly, she let me go in and out of work at different schedules so as to try to avoid the driver. This seemed to work for the first week and I thought it was over. Silly me, it wasn't. One morning I was going to the bakery to buy some fresh bread for lunch and there was the SUV. They started to slowly follow me. I was very anxious. I still shake just thinking about it. The only thing I was thinking was that I needed to run, but I didn't want to alert them that I knew they were following me. For context, my street was very long and on one side there were only buildings. On the other side, there was a tall wall. No houses, no people passing. My goal was to arrive to the little shopping center where the bakery was. But when I saw they were still following me, I knew that that wasn't a good option. They could get me on my way out. For the first time, it got confrontational. They rolled down one window and started to scream things at me. So I decided to go to my friend's office, which was on the second story of the shopping center. I quickly ran up the stairs and went into her office. I told her how they were following me and that this time I had an even worse feeling about it. She got scared also and told me to go hide in the bathroom and lock the door. A few minutes later, guess what? A chubby, balding man in his 40s walked in and casually asks her about me. He said he was driving down the street when he saw his cousin entering her office. Since it had been a while since he had last seen her, me, he wanted to say hi, but she didn't hear him calling her, so he parked his car and went up to greet her. He insisted that he had seen this cousin walking inside the office. But my friend, bless her, insisted with a poker face that no one had ever entered her workplace since a few hours ago. She said later that she was shaking inside, but she wasn't going to let them get the better of her. He asked if she was sure, and she kept telling the same story over and over and insisting that there was no one there and that she was all alone. She asked him to go. All the while, I was listening to this exchange from the bathroom. When he finally left, she closed her office and told me it was safe to go out. I cried. 
I was petrified with fear and terror, and so was she. We immediately called the police. This time they took me more seriously, and as I had the license plate number, they agreed to patrol the neighborhood on a regular basis. My friend called her boyfriend, who was a taxi driver from the company downstairs, and he took me home because my legs were shaking and I couldn't even move. From that day on, I always had someone driving me in and out of work or school, or I took taxis, something that I hadn't done before because they're expensive. I think the police presence in the area spooked him, or maybe the police found him and had a talk with him. I never knew. I never want to know either. I shiver thinking about what his intentions with me were, but the fear comes back every time I think about him. My parents still live in the area, as does my friend, but I eventually moved out of the city.